Radar Update. My name is Daniel Vallis from InformedChristians.com, a website ministry devoted to discerning current events from a Christian and biblical perspective. This is a warning, but it is not a prediction. I do not know the future. If you have not yet, definitely download our PDF resources on our website, Exodus 2, The Bride Goes to the King's House, which covers a lot of the patterns and shadows that we're looking at right now and have been considering over the past year. And there's a lot of other resources there as well, related articles, posters, and more materials. Right now we are on day 28 of the Jewish calendar, day 7 in the Jericho shadow pattern. And we must remember that it is just a shadow and it's a pattern. So we don't know how its fulfillment will be, whether it will take place today or in the near future. It is a shadow, which means it will be close to what it represents. But we've seen a lot of other symbols and patterns and shadows over this past month. And this is the month of redemption. So there is high expectation of something major happening very soon. And the celestial signs are still ongoing and there is so much engaged right now. It is amazing how the Jericho pattern is wrapping up this month, but how it is also tied in with a lot of the other events that have happened in this month too, shadows and patterns. I was reminded of the Jericho TV show, which was all about a nuclear attack on America, and this came out several years ago, and it had quite a following, but it was all about a surprise nuclear, not necessarily attack, but how life changed all of a sudden. And in a sense, that's the shadow and pattern that we're looking at right now, life is suddenly about to change. Sudden destruction is coming. We've heard the calls for peace and safety. We know that sudden destruction is coming in some form. And it appears to be related and tied to the Jericho shadow. There's also another TV show called Jericho, which was all about building a train bridge or viaduct, whatever you want to call it. This was on ITV. But it is all about building a raised bridge. And this is very important because a raised bridge, a viaduct, a highway, an elevated way is very important in the symbolism. And we haven't talked about it, but it's a shadow and pattern of the dimensional gateway and the highway between this world and another. It's a dimensional highway. And I'm leaving a link in the description box to another site that has done a more in-depth study on explaining it. But when you read throughout scripture, there's different mentions of highways and in how people will be conveyed to the new Jerusalem and highways that will exist in the new heavens and the new earth. And the idea of highways, it's much more than a physical highway. It's a dimensional highway. And that idea is also being played on right now with the Palmyra and the Baal gateways and all that because the gateways are part of the highways and the ways to the other dimension. When we look on the UNESCO website, we see up at their banner, and their banner does rotate between different events, but it comes all back to this one pretty often. It shows a historic viaduct over in Mexico, but it's very interesting that they show this, and it's very prominent, an elevated viaduct, and your chances are pretty high of seeing it when you come to the Palmyra site, and they're part of the ones who are organizing the World Heritage Day here pretty soon, which is when the bail gate's going to be up really the triumphal entry gate, but it's kind of intermingled with the bail gate. They're emphasizing both. The gateways, the concept of the gateway with the shadows and the patterns are more than just opening a gateway. It's a highway, in a sense, of opening a way into another dimension. And Satan knows there's about to be a highway open. There's about to be a gateway open. There's about to be a major transportation way made in a mass exodus. And it involves the time barrier. That's what we are in right now. In this existence, in this world, we are limited by time. Whereas beyond our dimension, it is not. And Satan is using a lot of conditioning and programming at this time to get people accustomed to some of the concepts that they will encounter soon. And also some of the technology that they will see and hear about. We talked about last time of Ezekiel's wheel and other technology. There is technology far more advanced than we can imagine that involves transporting across time, across dimensions, in realms we cannot see. And even in the Bible talks about the army of the Lord. There's armies of the Lord with their technology and their craft and their vehicles that they use that we cannot see because they exist right outside of our dimension. They're inside our dimension, but we can't see them because there's a barrier there. Elisha could see them, 
But we have to consider that a lot of the stuff is about to come onto the scene and be visible when the Son of Man is revealed. And also when the Son of Perdition is revealed. A lot of these are going to come into play. And Satan is conditioning his disciples and even the world now to a lot of the stuff that's about to be seen, heard, and experienced. Because he's going to portray it as an alien invasion. But we've talked a lot of before, and especially in our time soon in the Bible video, about the importance of time during these last days. And there's a lot that we do not understand in our limited uh, capacity now. But Satan is using a lot of these messages in his multimedia programming and conditioning that we can pick up on because he is showing a pattern. And with this Alice uh, through the looking glass piece that they keep pushing out, and especially their latest trailer, You'll notice, it's hard to notice in this picture, but she wears a lot of little golden bangles that hang off of her upper garment there. And that alludes to the bells on the high priest's garment that he was always using when he went into the most holy place. And part of the picture that Satan is showing with this Alice character is interdimensional travel across time barriers and crossing spiritual boundaries too as well. There's a lot more going on. But the world is about to see some very amazing things. And Satan is already getting the world ready for it, especially with the big push for Star Wars lately. It's going to be a great deception. So right now we find ourselves partly through day seven. There's still a good number of hours ahead of us. But we've seen a lot of the emphasis of gateways at this time because they know there's about to be a dimensional gateway opened around this time. We don't know when it is going to be. It may be today. It may be tomorrow. It might be in a few days. I do not know, but I highly suspect it's going to be very close to this time we're at right now. All we know is we are right on top of the shadow of it happening, so we should expect it any day now. If nothing happens today, tomorrow, or in the days ahead, we will always continue to seek the Lord for wisdom because we see ourselves getting more and more closer and the patterns coming together and the celestial signs. We see that we are getting closer. So we know time is very short. And someone sent this link to me today of in late January, January 28th, at Trafalgar Square. A sculpture artistic piece was put up called The Clockwork Lion by National Geographic. And it was made out of different clock parts and different clock themes and time themes. But it was only up for just one day at London's Trafalgar Square. And they were emphasizing how time was running out for saving the lions and blah, blah, blah. But we need to consider this as a message. They put it up at London's Trafalgar Square just not that long ago either. And we definitely need to remember that on January 1st is when they put out the big bold message that the stage is set and they are ready. They know that it is a countdown. Time is running out. But this was put up at Trafalgar Square just a few weeks ago, which is the exact same place where they're going to be putting up the Triumphal Arch. So this this is amazing that they've put up a lion right at the exact same place where they're putting up the Triumphal Arch, and we, which comes from Palmyra. Satan is counterfeiting the Lion of Judah coming through the Triumphal Arch. There's a lot of messaging and symbolism with this. They know what time it is. The son of perdition is about to be revealed shortly after the son of man is revealed. And yesterday we talked about the bail gate news in context of the other gates that we have seen talked about lately. So then it almost was not a surprise that today Google's doodle happened to be two pillar gateways. And they were putting it out to commemorate the 1896 Summer Olympics, which was the first modern Olympics. And on the official report, this is what the cover looked like at the time. And so they based the banner off of that. And of course, in the Greek culture and even the Roman culture and the ancient culture at the biblical time, and even at the time this was happening, palm trees, palm leaves are associated with victory as well as laurel. So you see those themes in that report at that time too. We've talked about before the two pillars symbolize gateways, a doorway, dimensional portal. And to see them pushing this at this exact same time is not coincidental. Especially when we see how much it mirrors the Masonic Royal Arch with a lot of themes from it. With the exact same number 69, which is often alluded to with the cancer sign. But it really symbolizes earth and heaven coming together. And we've talked about these scenes before of the red and blue. The earth and sky coming together, mingling together to form purple. 
That's the lie Satan has been telling from day one. You can be as gods, telling mankind, the earth, that you can be as gods, as the heavens. And so often in masonry, the two pillars represents the earth and the celestial, the skies, the heavens. A merging of the two is what the 69 represents. So here today on the Google Doodle, they show a hidden form of 69 with the two pillars, 18, which is a form of three sixes, 666 as well. They're portraying all that right in this midst when they're heavily, heavily pushing bail gateways, gateways, triumphal entries. Do you see how important they know this time is? Speaking of time, I was thinking about the calendar and all the patterns and shadows that are coming together this month. And I was reminded of the stories of Rahab and Ruth, the two Gentiles who were grafted into the lineage of the Messiah. And it's interesting when you consider Rahab and Ruth. Two women, one though, came right after the other. They both come in at this time of the month, but they have separate stories. And what I mean by that is we had talked before of how there's two harvests, barley harvest and wheat harvest, and they're quite separate and unique. We talked about how Pentecost, the Bible even tells us that is the time for the first fruits of the wheat harvest. The Passover time and the Feast of Unleavened Bread time, that's when the first fruits of the barley harvest are waved. So there's two separate harvests. We talked before of how it represents the foolish virgins and the wise virgins. The wise virgins are like barley. They don't have to be threshed. They just need to be winnowed. They're receptive to the Holy Spirit. Whereas wheat has to be threshed. It has to go through the tribulum because it did not want to prepare itself and purify itself beforehand. So there are two separate harvests. So it's interesting that we see a staggered approach with two wives that are in this month, but also in bride pictures in the lineage of the Messiah. Rahab, we talked about her story before, how we met up with her a few days before the Israelites entered the promised land. And then a few days up to where we are now is the seventh days where she got her redemption when the walls of Jericho fell down. And then she was eventually assimilated into Israel and married Salmon. And their son was Boaz, who married Ruth. So Rahab was directly related to Ruth in more than one way. But it's amazing that Rahab is associated and shown to us as in the barley harvest time. Whereas Ruth's picture is slightly different. We learn of her and she came to Bethlehem at the start of the barley harvest. So she is connected to all this. She is tied to all this. She is part of the bride. She is part of the wife. But the Bible also specifically tells us that it wasn't until the barley harvest and the wheat harvest were both completely finished that that is when she met up with Boaz and he worked out her redemption. That took place after the wheat harvest was finished. And we talked about before the wheat harvest will typically start before Pentecost, but it's not unusual for the wheat harvests to still continue after Pentecost. So she wasn't redeemed until Typically, probably right after Pentecost, sometime after that, in the weeks after that, just because of the time it would take to harvest the wheat. So we find two women mentioned in this month of redemption, both redeemed, both in the line of Jesus. But their story tells us that they are staggered right across the different harvests. I just thought that was very interesting. Of course, right now we are in the barley harvest and we are still in the Rahab picture. So there is a lot of expectation at this time. But this is also why we don't expect the barley harvest to go much further, or the patterns to go much further, because typically the barley harvest will be wrapping up by the end of April. So we have a great expectation for this time of the barley harvest. Now talking about the calendar, still a number of people, and I've seen this in a number of different articles and emails that people have sent to as well, some confusion about when Noah entered the ark. Now, if you had been with us for a while, you would have been with us when we talked about when Noah entered the ark and when it's historically commemorated in the eighth month, Hezvan. And the Bible gives us the dates of when it entered, when the flood started, and when Noah exited the ark too as well. All happened to land within that same month, and that's when they're commemorated. And we also talked about how the timing of the Star Bethlehem Echo Reminder was right there too. Now, this is the historic date that it's long been associated with and long understood to be at. And there's a lot of confusion because people read the accounts in Exodus around there and they think that we should bump up the dates. Well, that's not true because there are two different calendar systems. And you have to remember that the same writer who wrote Exodus also wrote Genesis, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They're all written by the same person. He knew the dates and they're recorded accurately. We talked about this in late October, how there were very significant signs in the heavens at that time, especially the star Bethlehem Echo reminder that we saw at that time. But even when you read the Jewish synagogue reading, 
Mountains, which are at that time, dealt exactly with Noah's Ark. It falls exactly on the days and the time periods, and those were largely organized by Ezra. So the understanding of this being the correct time with the Noah's Flood is long been understood. Noah's Flood happened in the fall, and that's when it's commemorated, and that's when even Ezra understood it to be happening, and that's even when it references, and even that's when Satan's own observations we talked about it in our videos at the time of how it ends right at the days of the dead. The flood starts exactly on the days when Satan and all of his occult followings and teachings celebrate the days of the dead. Because they're celebrating all of Satan's forces that died during the flood. That's what the Halloween celebrates. People, Christians who get involved in Halloween activities, they are observing and mourning the loss of the enemy. They are commemorating that. They're bemoaning the fact that they died. All of the demonic forces at that time. Christians should have no part in that. Noah's flood happened in the fall. That's very well assured. Remember on the calendar that it's separated into two separate cycles. There's a spiritual calendar which starts at the first of the year. But then the civil calendar starts at month seven. And a lot of things are dated by the civil calendar. And certain events such as a feast are done by the spiritual calendar. And we also talked about how this month is the month of kings because that was one special dating thing of how the king's genealogies and reigns were dated according to the spiritual calendar. So they have a very good understanding of which goes with what calendar and Moses did too as well because he wrote the first five books of the Bible. So just keep that in mind in the days ahead. There's going to be a lot of people speculating we're the days ahead if we're in the days of Noah. Not technically, but we are in the exact same times as Noah. And it's amazing right now. I'm not sure how many people of you know this, but there's a major museum work being built right now. They're building a full-sized ark. It's called ArkEncounter.com. Definitely go check it out. It's a creation ministry. They're building this gigantic museum for creation science. And it's amazing to see this being built right at this time. A full-size, life-size ark being built right now. And right now, it's the world's largest wooden structure in the entire world. You know, this by itself is a sign. It's a huge building. And so check out the link in the description box to that. But this is a sign. This should draw our attention and our study to what does the Bible mean when it says the days of Noah. It's not talking about after judgment, after it starts. And that's where a lot of people get confused on as well. No, the Bible gives us the exact descriptions, exact checklist. People are going to be partying, eating and drinking, buying and selling. The economy is still going to be going on. Marrying, planting, building. People are going to have an expectation for the future because they aren't aware that judgment is looming right over them. When the Bible talks about the days of Noah and the days of Lot, he's talking about the days right before judgment, how people were living right before judgment. They didn't even know it was about to happen. And this is why we must watch. Because you won't notice, you won't be able to tell it's the end of the world by watching the world news. I mean, you'll be able to tell things are getting bad. But Christ has given us signs to watch for, especially celestial signs that mankind cannot touch. Signs that we need to watch for. And we've been watching. We've seen so much come together right now. And that's why we need to rehearse the material. Definitely check out the Exodus 2 section. Rehearse your memory of what's been happening over the past year. God has been calling our attention. And we must shine bright at this time. We must be ready because we do not know what's coming in the hours and days ahead. But we know we are very close. We know we are running out of time. We have heard all these signs and warnings and calls. We've heard the trumpet call at midnight. And that reminds us of Matthew 25, 6. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. The trumpet call is not for our morbid curiosity. It's to tell us one thing very specifically. The bridegroom is coming. Make yourself ready. Friend, I hope that's what you are doing right now. I hope you are rising up. I hope you are casting off the works of darkness, putting on the armor of light, shining bright for him. It's interesting, the foolish virgins were told they need to go and buy oil. How do we buy oil? Well, shining bright for Christ, serving Christ will always cost us something. It'll cost us our time, our money, our talents, our focus, our life, what we are pouring ourselves into. Shining bright for Christ will cost us something. The Laodicean church, one of the seven churches, they were lukewarm. They did not want to spend. They did not want to have it cost them anything, their service for God. And so God told them that they were wretched and poor and miserable. Christ calls us to overcome. Christ calls us to give up our life as a living sacrifice for him, to shine for him, to burn at both ends for him, for things that will count for eternity. Because the bridegroom cometh, how will he find us? Will he find us shining bright for him? Wise and ready? 
or will he have to tell us, go and buy oil? There's going to be a lot of Christians left behind with the hypocrites and the unbelievers. And they will know that the reason is because they had not bought oil. Now is the time. After we've heard the trumpet call, now is the time before the bridegroom cometh. We know he is nigh even at the doors. Let us make sure we are shining bright for him now, so that we will hear him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Serve Christ first and highest above all else. Maranatha.